It's a honor to be here, here in Florence. I'm very happy uh, to be here. And we'll talk about uh, uh, virtual memory uh, and uh, virtualization in the Linux kernel. I worked on these topics for the last 20 years, almost, especially uh, on the kernel. And so I've seen how these things evolved from simple server workloads to cloud virtualization. So I'm going to show a little bit how the VM looked like also in the past and what were the main steps in the development of the virtual memory subsystem in Linux. And uh, then we see something more recent about uh, automatic Luma balancing, THP development, KSM scale, user fault FD, postcopular migration. And since being not 100% kernel-centric conference, I take the opportunity also to make uh, some consideration and some uh, thought about uh, the trade-offs between containers and virtual machines. So everything in the virtual memory works uh, through page tables. And the page tables since this picture will be arrows. And your program is running on virtual memory, which is the green uh, pages. And this is where you generally are programming. And uh, when you have a pointer, it's in the green area. And uh, these pages through the page table point to physical memory. And the blue area is the one, uh, the RAM, you actually buy physical and you plug into the hardware. So the green one is free, practically. And the blue one, however, is expensive. So the page table are erratic strings. So in this picture, there are only two arrows. In reality, there are 512 uh, arrows in the x86, x86 architecture. And uh, each page table is 4K. So by the way, this tree is structured uh, with four levels and 512 pointers. Uh, on the current uh, x86 architecture, you have 48 bits of virtual space usable, uh, what does it mean? It means in practice, uh, the x86-64 architecture can address about uh, 256 terabytes of virtual memory. In reality, because the kernel can only map the negative address space, uh, we, cannot, we cannot use more than 128. In fact, even less if you use uh, the randomization, uh, kernel address space randomization, which you should use. And, uh, uh, but I mean, we are dealing with uh, uh, definitely 64 terabytes. And uh, we have virtual machines nowadays uh, of four terabytes in size, real ones, not theoretical. So we are getting to the limit here in virtual memory. So now in the 4.13 kernel, recently, the five level page table have been introduced. And with five level, still with the same structure, so uh, we get nine more bits. If you do the same math as above, but, multi but uh, exponent by five, you will get 128 petabyte. So effectively, we will be able to map about uh, 64 petabyte. It's still huge, so there will be no more uh, issue for quite some time. And the fabric of the virtual memory are all this data structure which connects uh, uh, the hardware constrained structure like page table with the abstraction we are used to work with, like task processes, uh, virtual memory areas, uh, malloc, uh, and everything the user land sees. So the fabric is the most uh, black and white part. And then there are heuristics. So a lot of the VM is not black and white. A lot of it is the gray area. And the heuristics needs to solve problems which don't have a perfect solution. So the interesting thing in the memory management, in my opinion, is there is no perfect solution to that problem. When is the perfect time to swap a page? Which is the best page to pick in the world address space uh, of your computer to swap it out? So there is no perfect algorithm. There is no perfect solution. So. Uh, the kernel internally has these heuristics, and uh, it gets smarter, hopefully, all the time. And uh, uh, it can do uh, a decision based on statistics and uh, other uh, information the kernel collects while the application are running. And uh, the, 
And the memory management is also doing a lot of overcommit, even by default. So if you just boot the kernel uh, on any computer, the Linux kernel on any computer, it will be using overcommit. It's not extremely overcommitted. So if you ask a, a four gigabyte machine to allocate four terabyte, the kernel will say no. <laughs> that's you know that's too much. But if you ask a, one gigabyte five times, it will say yes, because it expects you're not using all of it. So it's a kind of uh, best effort by default, but still over committed. Uh, but for example, Android uses echo one in the over commit memory, which means completely turn off the limit. So if, uh, if you ask uh, for a terabyte and you have only four gigabyte, you're still getting it. Just virtual memory, you know, it's not a real deal. Uh, you will you will have to swap four terabyte to actually be able to use it if you only have four gigabyte. Of course, four terabyte minus four gigabyte. So <coughs> the basic structure in the VM uh, are uh, these LRUs, which are active and inactive. Least recently used lists are used to uh, index all the cache and. Uh, uh, even uh, recently, in 2012-2014, uh, there have been improvements in this area, significant improvements in the way we can balance these active and inactive lists. So to show the picture, uh, the inactive list contains uh, uh, the, let's say, not uh, uh, referenced memory, the not referenced cache, and uh, when you get a working set activation through a reference, uh, the page goes from the inactive list to the active list. And then it becomes, uh, again, uh, inactive, and eventually it will be freed. So the whole idea of this active and inactive list, uh, which I worked on in 2001, so this is really ancient, but it's still there in the kernel today, uh, is uh, when you're doing a backup, for example, and you read the, uh, and write only once to the disk, you will activate a lot of cache, you will load a lot of cache, but uh, there's no point to keep it uh, around. You don't want to destroy the working set you have and that you are really using frequently because you ran a backup or because maybe you're reading a big file which cannot possibly fit into the cache. So the idea is the working set is going to be alive and stay in the active list while uh, the garbage goes through the inactive list. And active and inactive lists can be seen uh, in the meminfo. These are the levels. Uh, you, can, you can just run this command anywhere, even on a cell phone. Android cell phone, of course. <laughs> uh, then um, the other basic structure in the VM is the uh, reverse mapping. So the LRU gives you the pages that you might want to shrink, that you might want to frame. And uh, these pages might be mapped in your program. So we need to unmap them before they can be freed. And uh, the uh, reverse mapping is uh, a code in the kernel, the algorithm in the kernel, which allows you to find uh, where the pages are mapped given any physical page. And this is the full picture with LRUs and uh, RMAP working all together. And that's the way the kernel worked since about uh, 2.6.5. And uh, the idea is you have uh, these LRU lists which index the memory. These are the page structure. Each one of these in means a page of memory for kilobytes, so each page in the RAM is index is uh, divided in pages. So uh, given any page, uh, you can reach the virtual address with our map. And with the virtual address, then you can unmap the page and finally can be freed. And the recent virtual memory trends are uh, uh, going in the direction of optimizing the workload for you. So you have to do less uh, manual tuning. For example, there are NUMA hard binnings, which have been available for a long time with NUMA control. And nowadays, we have automatic NUMA balancing. And uh, there's a huge CDBFS also available for a long time 
since uh, 2011, we have transparent huge pages. And transparent huge pages are moving more into more parts of the uh, memory management subsystem, like uh, the MPFS. Then we have uh, page pinning. Page pinning is a technique used by many drivers to prevent the pages to be uh, freed while they are doing DMA effectively. So like Odirect uh, is doing page pinning. And uh, uh, nowadays we have MMU notifiers. MMU notifiers allows, for example, the KVM memory, which is mapped by the shadow page tables, to be swapped out. And then we have uh, HMM and uh, UVM, which allow even to compute seamlessly uh, into the GPU memory. So the idea is uh, uh, you are going to compute in uh, your application uh, and then you can tell the kernel uh, to automatically move the memory into the GPU memory and run the computation on the GPU. And then when you access the memory again from your program, it will be the kernel that puts it back in, in the original place. And all this optimization, by the way, can be optionally disabled. So if you want to do things still with the hard bindings, you can. So you can just run NUMA control, for example, and automatic NUMA balancing will be overridden. It will do nothing, effectively. If you ask uh, the kernel, put this program in this node, pin it to a single CPU, pin it to a single node of memory, the process will stay there, and automatic NUMA balancing will be deactivated on the process. So can we use all these nice features to manage the memory of virtual machines? I mean, I've showed a lot of features that would be nice to be able to use those for virtual machines, not only for processes. What I've shown works for any program you run on Linux. And what about hypervisors? So the idea is, why should we reinvent anything? Uh, and uh, effectively, we don't, because we use KVM. And with KVM, uh, the hypervisor is effectively a very similar to a Linux process. So from the VM standpoint, in fact, it's identical. And uh, the KVM philosophy is to reuse as much Linux code as possible. We focus on only on the virtualization and leave the other things to the respective developers. For example, we don't try to reinvent in KVM the virtual memory. I mean, when you have um, some overcommit in the virtual machines you're running on top of KVM, and a page of the virtual machine needs to be swapped out. The code that decides which page has to be swapped out is identical to the normal one you have on the host without virtualization. Exactly the same code. So there's no difference. The page will be taken is the same. And the same thing for the CPU scheduler. When you schedule different virtual machines, they schedule just like if they were regular Linux processes. We don't have to reinvent a new scheduler in a new brand new hypervisor. And then I can go on and go on with NUMA, power management. Everything will need to be rewritten if, if we weren't using the KVM philosophy here. So we have a model which integrates very well into the existing infrastructure. And sometimes we have to add notifiers, like for example, MMU notifier, scheduler notifier. So sometimes we need an integration between something the, the memory management of the virtual machine requires uh, like in this case, a memory notifier, and what Linux provided before it. So we just make the code generic enough that it can be used not only for KVM, but for example, also for RDMA, for uh, GPUs. So we always try in Linux, when we add a new feature, that it doesn't only have a single user, but there are many users of it. We try to abstract as much as possible. And uh, the KVM design, again, uh, shows uh, the virtual machine to be just like a regular process, except it can also run in guest mode. Uh, with, uh, uh, without KVM, uh, we only had the user space and kernel. And uh, since we have KVM, we also have the guest mode switch. And when you have a lightweight exit from the guest, uh, you will stop at the kernel level. If you have, I uh, don't know, for example, an MMIO, VLTIO backend in QEMU, which is implemented in userland, you will have to exit down to userland. And when you have to go 
with the expensive, not lightweight exit, this will be slower. So we always try, for example, I'm not sure if you know if anybody uh, is using uh, VHostNet, for example. VHostNet is uh, increasing performance of gas VRTO very significantly. And if you use VHostNet, uh, the networking stops between guest and kernel. If you use VRTO net without VHostNet, the MMIO will go down to user land, and that's why it's lower. So I'm going to show now some benchmark showing what uh, uh, this uh, new feature can provide. And uh, this is an example of a database workload uh, with different number of users. In this case, we have uh, 10 uh, clients. In this case, 20, 40, 80. And uh, so there will be three columns where the middle one is the automatic NUMA balancing. And uh, the blue one is uh, uh, NUMA pinning. So again, when you do NUMA pinning, even if automatic NUMA balancing is on, it's irrelevant because you pinned it, so it's just like if it was off, right? So uh, the, the important thing is to compare uh, the three columns, and uh, what we want is the automatic NUMA balancing to be as close as possible to the NUMA pinning. So we want the red column to be as close as possible to the blue one. And for up to 40 users, it's practically very close. So the kernel can balance the workloads automatically without the user, the administrator, to partition the machine by hand. Effectively saying, this application is running on this node. This application is running on the other node. And when I say NUMA hardware, effectively any computer today, any server uh, running with two sockets or more, so two physical CPU plugged into the motherboard, these will have NUMA effects. So there will be more than one memory channel. And so automatic NUMA balancing is effectively useful for a, a huge number of servers uh, out there today. Uh, it's, it's very important for performance because if you don't get this right, in the worst case, it can be massively slower, even slower than what you shown in this picture. And uh, you can see if your hardware, where you, you have servers, you're maintaining servers, you want to know if it's NUMA, the common NUMA control hardware, if it shows multiple nodes, that's NUMA hardware. And uh, you can see the effect of automatic NUMA balancing enabled and disabled by echoing 0 and 1 into this control. This is available since uh, uh, RHEL 7. And uh, uh, of course, also upstream. And uh, with this tuning, you can uh, benchmark and see the effect of the feature on your current workloads. So, what about huge pages? Huge pages uh, are uh, pages which are five times, 512 times bigger than uh, the regular page. The regular page size on the x86 architecture is 4K. So effectively, they are 2 megabytes in size. And uh, from uh, another point of view, a huge page uh, is uh, removing one layer of page tables. Uh, so in order to manage these uh, huge pages, the kernel has to do much less work. It will uh, be much quicker at finding where it's located the TLB uh, will be doing lookups faster and uh, less frequently. The, so the benefit of huge pages, of course, is increased performance because of the TLB benefits. There is a cons. So you might want to be aware what are the cons when you enable this feature. So the cons is uh, when you have a page fault, before the page can be mapped into the user land, you need to clear it because it might contain memory from another user or maybe from some page cache, which was read from disk before. And uh, uh, clearing to megabyte takes more time. So effectively, it's increasing the latency of the page fault. If we clear only 4K, it's going to be much quicker. So in some cases, this is a problem. And uh, just recently, in the 4.13 kernel, 
after being an improvement from Andy Clean and Ying Wang, uh, which uh, improved the performance of this uh, huge page clear by 28%. And uh, it was a pretty simple idea, but very effective. So simple to implement, but very cute idea, which is to clear around. And you, the last uh, memory you clear is the one at the address which triggered the fault. So when you return to user land, you know user land will touch that address. And so you make sure that by the time you return to user land after the page fault, that address is hot in the cache. Because it was the last one that the CPU cleared. Before this optimization, we were just, you know, clearing it in uh, virtual address order. We didn't care if the page fault was in the middle, at the start, or at the end. So uh, just simple optimization like that in the kernel, of course not for all the workloads, but for uh, this specific VM scalability uh, workload, which is test case, of course, it's artificial, but it still shows 28%, which is quite significant, an increase of performance. So uh, there are other cons, uh, of course, the one I should mention is potential higher memory footprint. So if you want to be sure not to use any more bytes than your application needs, transparent huge pages uh, is not ideal for you. But you know, the overhead is so insignificant that generally that is not a problem. The only thing which can be a problem effectively is the latency of the page fault. So in performance terms, uh, the optimization is uh, much more effective for virtual machines. And the reason is because virtual machines have two nested level of page tables. So the TLB miss is way more expensive for virtual machines than for a uh, regular Linux host. You can tune uh, transparent huge pages using uh, CCFS with slash sys kernel mm transparent huge pages enabled. And there is uh, uh, these values, always I'm advised and never. Generally, it's a good idea to keep it always. So uh, sometimes there have been reports like uh, some database which was running slower. So generally, the problem is not in the transparent which pages main knob, but it's in the compaction control. So if you ever run into any performance issue with transparent which pages, it's much better to set the defrag option to be M advised instead of always, and leave the main knob, transparent which pages enabled, as set to always. And the reason is because generally it's way more expensive to generate a new page than it is to use it. So the main cost of uh, when both knobs are set to always is on the, the fragmentation side. The fragmenting the memory is quite expensive. It requires copies and moving memory around, including uh, page migration. <clears throat> Another option which might be interesting is how to prime the VM. So sometimes there are applications which uh, benefits massively from uh, transparent huge pages. And to be sure you are getting the maximal transparent huge pages utilization without rebooting, of course, without rebooting the machine, you can use this technique uh, which consists in priming the VM. And the idea is uh, to echo three in uh, slash proxy VM drop caches. This command will work anywhere, including my cell phone. And then just run echo uh, into compact memory in the same location. So what happens here is first you try to free all the freeable cache, free all the slabs, free all the day entries, free all the nodes, then free all the page cache. Then after everything has been freed, you run a pass of compact memory. And as you can see, the fact that at the body level, this is, a, this is a number of two megabyte pages in the system, and this is a number of four megabyte pages in the system. After we free all the memory, we start to get a couple of um, two megabyte and four megabyte pages. But after we run full defragmentation triggered by the compact memory command, then we get quite a huge number of those. And then this command is useful in some case. So it's even recommended that if your application 
really requires this kind of priming, you can do it. I mean, this is stable, it's, it's not a hack. Uh, it's not generally required, but if your application requires it, this is a possibility. So for example, benchmarks. Benchmark certainly will benefit from this strict. So uh, since uh, uh, the kernel 4.8, now we have transparent huge page source and TMPFS. Uh, this requires a mount option change, so, so by default, in the upstream kernel, it's not getting activated. There are many ways to activate it, but generally, the one I would like you to remember is within iSythe. So within iSythe works slightly different than the THP for anonymous memory. For anonymous memory, whenever we can use a huge page, we use it. Because generally, when you say malloc to make a byte, you generally don't use only one byte. And uh, uh, so in this case, however, because he has small files, you may have just, you know, unpacked the kernel tarball. In this case, it's completely legitimate to have a very small file, like, I don't know, uh, one kilobyte. And then you don't want to allocate a two megabyte page to store only one kilobyte. So within iSize is efficient for small files. It's not using transparent huge pages for small files, but that's the right thing to do, generally. And uh, then we have uh, a, a global knob that you can also use to affect uh, other kind of shared memory APIs. For example, uh, System 5 shared memory, MMFD, well, I'm not going to list them all, but they are all backed by an internal TMPF TMPFS mount. So effectively, it's all TMPFS. Just you don't have a mount option, and that's why we have the global GNOME. So there have been also improvement in KVM scale, uh, K KSM scale. KSM is uh, the kernel same page merging, or kernel shared memory, as you wish. And this does the duplication. And uh, the duplicating the memory, however, was too efficient. So we had to limit it a little bit because this list was unlimited. We got millions of entries. So everything was running fine until eventually this page with one million of sh shares, it will try to be swapped out or maybe migrated with compaction. At that point, the system will freeze for one minute, working one million of these RMAP entries. So we had to make it a little more conservative, and now there is a parameter in the last upstream 4.13 kernel uh, where you can set the max page sharing. And this solves the problem completely, so there's no risk of uh, impact in latency, and uh, the performance is always stable and constant. Another thing which uh, I'd like to mention in the latest innovation is user port FD. This is called cool. I introduced uh, a couple of years ago to implement uh, a post copy line migration. And uh, the idea is uh, to run a computation on remote memory. So it's post copy line migration is effectively a form of memory externalization where you have a compute node and a memory node. So you put the memory of the virtual machine in one computer, and the virtual machine, however, is running on the CPU of a different computer. And this technique, uh, user fault FD, allows you to get uh, the memory during the fault and transfer it locally, and in theory, you could even push the local memory to the remote node which contains the memory. And uh, user fault FD latency is similar to what you will get uh, on a very fast uh, uh, SSD swapping. And uh, uh, the benchmark here is showing a pre copy line migration with uh, the post copy line migration. And the pre copy is uh, uh, running slow during the wall line migration. But the, the even worse thing is it never completes. So the benchmark ends while the line migration hasn't completed yet. So it will take only 120 seconds to transfer the RAM over the network, considering the size of this virtual machine. But it's not enough. With pre-copy, this virtual machine is changing the memory too rapidly. 
And so there's not enough time to transfer it to the destination because it got dirty again. You know, the memory is much faster generally than the network. So it's, you can deal with the memory faster than you can transfer it. And this is exactly what was happening in this benchmark, which was a standard database uh, benchmark. With post-copy live migrations, there's no such problem. The live migration is always guaranteed to succeed because you are going to immediately start running on the destination. And in fact, it takes uh, time here uh, to get back to the 100% performance, but just because there is k-huge page d, which needs to recreate the huge pages. Uh, currently, the user faults are using 4k pages. So uh, in these uh, user faults, we get uh, uh, not immediate huge page performance. So they are getting recreated by Diamond, call it k-huge page d in the background. And the end result, uh, comparing another technique called auto-converge, which is also guaranteeing to succeed the live migration, is quite significant. And uh, this is uh, total live migration time. Uh, live migration uh, with auto-converge is slowing down the guest. And uh, uh, by slowing down the guest, uh, the memory which gets dirtied is less and less. So eventually, it will be so slow that the network can actually transfer the dirt machine to the destination. The latency also is much better. And the auto-converge latency was generated by this artificial slowdown, not by the actual downtime. So the latency was happening while the virtual machine was still running on the source, not during the transfer from source and destination. So there are many potential use cases besides virtual machines. So I think that's all, and uh, if you have any question. Hi. Um, you mentioned that in, f in Linux 4.13, uh, a new layer um, has been added to the page, um, um, Radix 3. Um, I'm wondering what are the are there any cost implications in terms of performance overhead or anything like that in adding a new layer? Yes, that's a very good question. So the five level page tables, correct? Yes, so the, four le the five level page table even have uh, some overhead by just the fact the CPU has to work five level page tables. So from uh, the current standpoint, I think this is all possible to optimize. So this is a very new feature. So I don't know if there's any hardware currently with five levels. But uh, uh, the overhead at the source and software level can be eliminated completely. So we can optimize it uh, like 99.9%. Uh, the CPU, if it's lower by doing TLB miss working five levels, that's not up to me to decide, and I assume when they will ship it, it will be very efficient also with five levels. But uh, yes, we need uh, a little bit of optimization. The current code might not be final yet, uh, but the plan is to make it completely uh, zero overhead, or at least almost zero overhead. Any other question? So it seems we it seems we do not have any other any other questions. So thank you again, uh, thank you. Andrea. Thank you. Thank you very much.